This is a webinar on best practices for force measurement, common measurement errors, and challenges on CMC uncertainty for force measurements. So best measurement practice is talking to the customer and replicating via calibration how the instrument is being used. We're going to give a lot of examples of this, uh, the different error sources. People may send instrumentation in for calibration with notes, please calibrate, or they may request an accredited calibration. That is often not enough. There are various uh, different error sources from adapters, technique, alignment, you name it. Today we're going to cover cover some of them, some of the important ones. I'm hoping that everybody gains some insight and I encourage questions. So if you have questions, put them in the chat window. We are also recording this for people to view later that could not attend the meeting right now. So important, um, if you're not a customer, I recognize some people on the list. I'm hoping you become a customer of ours if, if you're not already. Uh, me specifically, I'm the president of Morehouse uh, and our company is very passionate about making good measurements. Uh, so I will be giving you every bit of information I can and telling you everything I can during this time. There's a lot involved in creating the best calibration lab. It's, there's a lot involved in creating this content. Each time we give it, we say things a little bit differently. There's more tidbits to pick up on. We add things, as I mentioned earlier, this one is different than the one we gave um, about three months ago in that we've added things. We've done more testing and adding it added it back in. There was, was, was a very good Facebook discussion that uh, we added three slides uh, based on that that discussion today. So a little bit uh, about myself, uh, President Morehouse. I've been here since 1994. Then I went away for a while, came back in 1999, uh, worked as a force calibration technician, done almost every job in the company from uh, cleaning up roadkill to on the on the street outside, uh, to sweeping the floors, uh, calibration, uh, you name it, just did about everything in, in, in the company and uh, spent a lot of time in the calibration lab. And uh, around uh, 2009, we started giving classes at uh, NCSLI. So that's that's when all this came about and we started doing more research and doing more testing and really p trying to position ourselves as the best commercial force laboratory in the, in, in the world. And uh, uh, our goal is to become that. So it's me picture of me maybe a little old what we do if you if those uh, of, of those here do not recognize us we manufacture force calibration products we calibrate force measuring equipment using standards with very low uncertainties these standards allow us to lower the uncertainties of equipment sent to us for calibration that's reducing risk uh, helps reduce your risk the new standard will deal with that and we help labs make better measurements it's passion uh, very passionate about that so if you attend this webinar you have questions Put them in the chat window. Send me an email afterwards if you don't want to. If you don't want to uh, ask now, I'll hang around after the webinar. Uh, if anybody has specific questions, unmute yourself. We can have discussions. Uh, just any anything that's on your mind, we can talk about it. So, I have some questions to start this. Um, one of them. Uh, one of them is: Are you confident that your equipment is calibrated properly? Um, even if you send it to us, do you know that you know you should send the adapters in? We talk to most customers about it, but some some we can't get on the phone, so it's it can be difficult. Uh, then then it's email and tag and back and forth. Is your force calibration provider following the proper standards? Do you know if they're doing that? If you say uh, I need calibration to ISO 17025, there's there's some marks in there, uh, comments in there that say about making statements of compliance that we've seen lots of people not follow. ASTM E74 is a standard we see people not follow. So and um, do you have a set of adapters and are you sending the adapters to your force calibration provider for calibration? All very good questions here. These are all things that need to happen. And do you know how your calibration provider is loading the instrumentation? We're going to talk a little bit about that. So. In general, the abstract, this is about a 50-minute webinar. Uh, we will cover the following, uh, common force measurement errors and the importance of calibrating the instrument in the manner it is being used. Examples of CMC for force scopes and shortcut slabs take that put you at risk. Little, little overview on documentation, uh, 17025, 5.4.1. The laboratory shall use the appropriate methods and procedures for all tests and or calibration within its scope. What's the importance of this? Uh, the real importance is the calibration must be performed using an acceptable and agreed upon calibration method or procedure. Con this is the contract review phase. This is where we should have the email. We should have the conversation, whatever your preference is for communication. And the results must be provided in a report with the necessary information. 
So this is what should happen. We should have these discussions. We should ask the right questions about, do you have top adapters? Have you sent them? Do you need them ground? Uh, other, uh, all the things that are pertinent to your instrumentation and the calibration. And this, this does not only apply to force, it applies to almost every parameter. Um, and and what, what ends up happening or what, what goes wrong um, is the reference laboratory may only check the calibration procedure and not mention the adapters used to perform the calibration. So we contract review, we have as PO, we talk to you and you said, oh, calibrate to 17025 accredited. Great. Uh, lots of labs will check it off at that point. Uh, when it when we do the cal, we try to reach out and get a little more information. Uh, maybe sometimes it's it's bothersome to the customer on how much information we want to get, but we want to ensure you get the proper results. So there may be more than one phone call to ensure that uh, if more questions come up, or if indicator settings are different than what's expected, or if adapters aren't labeled or cables aren't labeled. There there may be several calls back and forth. Uh, uh, even the ASTM E74 standard does not address. Uh, measurement errors associate with the use of different calibration fixtures. This is a significant source of error and variability between labs that adhere to ASTM E7413 or other standards. It's a problem. Uh, you have a, a standard and it does not address adapters. So another problem we, we face, and I stuck this in here because we've had we've had some shipping complaints from OOPS and, uh, and FedEx. People send instrumentation in, they ship it, and they just send, throw it in a box and send it in, and then the cable gets severed or something else. So here's recommended practice to the left, the Pelican case, custom cut foam. This is one that we make, a Morehouse case, that if you buy equipment or you have equipment, we will gladly foam a case. Uh, there is a fee. Uh, then double boxing and the BAD. BAD is just this this blow packaging where you're, you just send a heavy instrument and and chip it with the cable and the instrument wiggles around vibrates around creates some pockets and then guess what if if they drop it if oops drops it then uh then you might have a severed cable and then the ugly is just wrapping things up in cellophane throwing them on a skid and sending them and what does this if it's damaged during shipment problems as lost calibration history unrepairable scenarios extra cost to repair and claims may not be paid we're seeing a numerous reports numerous claims that just are not are just not being paid. So it's uh, please take the extra time to pack the equipment. So let's get into the heart of this. Um, the heart of this is adapters and the importance of adapters. And the first thing is keeping, we're talking about force. So the importance is keeping the line of force pure, free from eccentric forces is key to cal the calibration of load cells. ASTM does not address the various adapter types, but ISO 376 does. ISO 376 is the European standard. Anyone that's calibrating to ISO 7500, calibrating testing machines to 7500, is going to be following 376. Anyone that's calibrating uh, other standards to E4 uh, is going to be following ASTM E74. So the importance of these two standards, uh, basically ISO 376, the importance is it recognizes the importance of adapters and reproducibility conditions of the measurement. Proper adapter use in accordance with ISO 376 Annex A helps ensure the reliability of reported measurements. Um, Look, Annex A is not a requirement. It's in this webinar. It's good for anybody making force measurements, whether it's you know ISO 376, ASTM E74, or just general measurements. Having the right adapters are critical for uh, to ensure that you repeat the results. So, what does 376 say? A A A point four. Uh, one says load, loading fitting should be designed in such a way that the line of force application is not distorted. As a rule, tensile force transducers should be fitted with two ball nuts, two ball cups, and if necessary, with two intermediate rings, while compressive force transducers should be fitted with one or two compression pads. So then we get into, okay, so says this, where do I get these adapters? Well, this, these, this set of adapters is a combination of ISO 376 and a combination of lean. If anybody's had lean, lean, lean is a manufacturing process, which focuses on quick 
change uh, change over quick setup time cycle time and everything else so we've made one set of adapters here on, here on the right and then on the left there are various thread sizes that thread into these adapters so if you're doing a tension application you don't need to have a ton of adapters you can have one kit that has all the thread sizes you need for the stuff that's done in your lab and to, to illustrate this a little bit better is this picture here on the left is a cal machine with with those same tension adapters with the sphericals and clevises to calibrate like a Dillon ED2000 or a Tractel. And then on the right is a setup with a, with a load cell. And these, those adapters with the sphericals help keep the line of force pure. So competence and measurement error. Um, examples of competence, some examples using proper adapters when calibrating force instruments. Here's what we've seen. Improper adapters can produce errors 10 to 20 times that of manufacturer stated accuracy. We're going to show you that in a, in a second. Uh, proper alignment of the UUT, unit under test, adapters, and proper methods for loading threads, misalignment, different hardness of adapters, and thread loading versus shoulder loading contribute to a decrease in repeatability of measurement results resulting in additional measurement error. And we're going we're gonna to go over examples of all of these. And then re repeatability and reproducibility tests as well as proficiency tests are good methods for detecting measurement errors. So let's get to it. The first example here, hopefully someone has seen some of these. Uh, this is this is a tension link. This is specifically these are made by Dylan. They're all the same. Um, but here's one loaded with the proper pin diameter. So this is a 50 ton clevis and the proper pin diameter is 50 millimeters, which is 1.97 inches. So load with the proper pin diameter on the right instrument reads 50,000 pounds. So load with smaller pins. Guess what? Customer didn't send the pins. So I was going to any laboratory in the world. They said, someone says, hey, what do we have to calibrate this? Oh, we have this set of pins. They're one and a half inches. Okay, load with smaller pins. So we load with a smaller pin. Guess what? Instrument now reads 49,140. That is a difference of 860 pounds or 1.72% error at 50,000 pounds from not using the proper size load pins. This is an out of tolerance versus an intolerance, and this instrumentation is specced at 0.1%. So we are already at 17.2 times what the manufacturer's specification is. And not to pick on Dylan, I blocked their name out, but uh, tension links of this design seem to exhibit similar problems. If you're unsure, you need to test them. Almost every tension link of this design we've seen, Dylan, Tractail, all of them have the same error. The way, the way to avoid it is send whatever you're using with it in for calibration and let the lab use the exact pins that you're using. And here's a write-up from Dylan. Uh, they were very good. They acknowledged this. They said, here's what they sent me back in an email because we had a, a discussion between several customers and, and Dylan. And Dylan said, hey, here's what you need to do. Using correct size pins is critical. If links are damaged, highly used, or worn, decrease the time between recalibrations. The same size and style of shackle and pin used during operation should be used for calibration. Maintaining pin orientation is best practice from Dylan. That's what needs to be done if you want to maintain that accuracy specification. Misalignment. This is great. People buy these S-beam load cells. They, ha they do have a good purpose, but here we put, we put an S-beam load cell in our, in our dead weight frame, and we misaligned it slightly. So the picture on the left is, is the output of this cell with a, with a top lock aligned, what I call aligned in machine. Alignment is never perfect. There's always some error in it, but it's aligned as well as we can. And then the picture on the right is, is hey, we're just gonna slightly bump it off, you know? And imagine someone that's out in the field doing E4 test or doing tests and, and they're, they try to align it. It's, it's very possible that they could be off an eighth of an inch. They could be off a 16th of an inch. So this picture, we're, we're off maybe an eighth of an inch, uh, maybe, maybe a little less. And the output is is varying significant. In fact, just from that eighth of an inch misalignment, if we look at all the uncertainty contributors and figure this in, the expanded uncertainty when we're aligning it and doing an E74 cal on the left is 9.95 pounds on a 10,000 pound load cell. Not bad. That's not bad to, to, to know that within 10, to know your uncertainty within 10 pounds on a 10,000 pound load cell. If we just slightly misalign it, 
our uncertainty jumps from 9.95 to 85 pounds. What does that do? If we do a whole well sathered way to combine uncertainty analysis, which people probably like, what's that? That's that's getting into we can you can read blogs and other stuff of it. But what it means is if we do a combined uncertainty analysis here, what we think is good to 9.95 pounds. If you if you follow this through the whole range, you're at 86.606 at the end at 100 percent. And And look how it progressively gets worse. Now, if we do the same thing on a Morehouse cell. And we we deliberately we have videos online. We deliberately misalign it more than an eighth of an inch here. Output changes, but the cells are compensated differently. The inner inner strain gauges and everything else are compensated for some misalignment. And if we do the same thing on one of our cells, we're expecting an output of uh, uh, uncertainty of 0.4, uh, like 0.4 pounds, and we're getting point. 527. So uh, really a difference, the uh, error difference on, on a shear web cell is, is around 0.0022, 22 parts per million. Doubt you're going to notice that in a testing machine. So next we're going to get to the picture I posted on Facebook that got some people to sign up and lots of good debate on this. Different hardness of top adapters. This is People fail to realize this. So we have a customer send us a cell and it shifted from one calibration to the next. And we we did test after test after test. We said, well, maybe maybe someone used the bottom adapter instead of the top one and, and everything else. So we did lots of tests. And here, um, here's pictures of the test. We used our block, we used their blocks, we did days of tests and, and everything else. But what was interesting on this is a 4340 top block versus the hardened top block that came with the load cell. There was a difference of 0.3%, 0.307% just by using different top blocks on the cell. I've seen this before, point, before, before we've done these tests, I've seen errors of 0.15, it's pretty common, but this, this one was quite large and all cells react differently to the type of top adapter. And why do they react differently? I, there's points that need to be made here. There are two points to make on this. Material with different hardness experience different amounts of lateral deflection under the same amount of load. This causes different amounts of stress between the block and the load cell. That's one point. The number two point is flatness and smoothness of the block is important and that it will change the contact position on the load cell. So the assumption here is that a manufacturer makes a load cell. Uh, this, this type of cell that's pictured above left has a radius of R17 and it's designed to be loaded exactly at the center of that spherical section. If we change that um, and you put a different block in um, and, and introduce an unbalanced or, um, you know, we introduce a non-flat block. We can shift that contact point to and produce some off-center loading. And as that happens, your stress analysis, the stress analysis shows a small amount of shift will change the stress distribution. The key is to use the same adapters in use as used in calibration. The adapter should be manufactured not to produce off-axis loads. So this stress analysis is to the left here. This is what's happening. You can see this this one's with thread engagement, which we're going to cover a little bit later. But the same thing happens with a top block. You change that top position and you change the stress analysis. So what causes this material deformation? Well, the picture at the top left is a sacrificial block that we had that was ground that when people do not send adapters in, we use we use a, a ground flat block and we're, we, we tell them what we use. But if you notice this block, this is from the yoke of our dead weight machine. If you notice this, it's, it's marked up. This is one that we've done numerous tests with and we've just deformed it. And why does it deform? It's material with a lower yield strength than what is being applied will deform until the maximum compressive stress is below the material yield point. So basically we have deformation until compressive stress is less than yield stress. A steep radius concentrates the force over a smaller area and may cause material to permanently deform. This is why we recommend having a more house compression top block made it to any load so you can have other people make top blocks a picture on the left we put a we put an o-ring in there we drill a we drill a little air hole so it can slide on the top and bottom and with this type of pad, this this pad is always made it to the load cell. these come back in for calibration and the change is is 
that we see from the meter in the cell, we know it's not related to the top block and using different top blocks. And we avoid the 0.3% errors. We get very, very good agreement with this. Um, the customer then has the O-ring. They can secure it on the cell. It's very repeatable. Um, you get the cell, you get it calibrated by us with the block, repeatable. You can expect the same performance when when you use it in your setup and your machine. So talking that was talking about the hardness of the pad. So now there's another thing. It's loading through different thread depths. Um, below is a test uh, that we did. We did two different types of adapters, recorded the readings with 10,000 pounds applied. Output was 10,001.5 with one and a half inches of engagement versus 9942.3 with a half inch engagement. There was a difference of 59.2 pounds on a 10,000 pound cell. So this was a this was a Sensatec model RFG F22601 cell. Customer did not send in the adapters. We asked them about it. They said, use your adapters and report what you did. So we, I did it. I took two different adapters. I want to test this cell. I've tested other cells. Maybe this one doesn't have the issue that, that some other ones did. Uh, and used these two different adapters pictured on the right. And I got way, 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 way different output uh, depending what adapter I used. So the error on this measurement was over 0.5% on a device expected to be better than 0.25%. And then I have to ask, how are your devices being calibrated? You're here listening to this. Are you sending, if you have cells with threads in them, are you sending the adapters you use for calibration with, with the instrumentation? If you're not, chances are there's a large error and you're not replicating or repeating what the calibration lab did and your results are not going to match. And then here was this picture again. And this picture really does show that different stress distribution here on, on, the, on the threaded engagement going, going through the uh, inner workings of the load cell. Multi-column load cell. So we had this load cell. It had this base. You can see this base. It's just non-ground. It's not a, It was not a flat base. I said, you know what? Before we do anything with this, let's, do, let's test it. So we test, tested it, non-flat base, maximum error here. Uh, you can see the maximum error with a non-flat base, 12 pounds uh, when rotated at 30,000, at 150,000, 136 pounds, at 300, 342. And then guess what? Then we took that base and we ground it flat and we stoned it and we got everything in and we repeated the same test. We rotated the load cell 120 degrees, repeated the same test and our errors went from 0.114% to 0.023%. So flatness is absolutely critical to ensuring the repeatability of the load cell when rotated. Loading through the bottom threads and compression. Now, picture on the left is how we typically will calibrate a load cell. Uh, we talk to several of our customers. This is not always a question that's, that's asked. This is usually if we know someone is coming from one of our competitors and wants to use us because of the better uncertainties or because of other reasons, we basically ask, start asking them. I said, hey, when you, when you went to that other lab, you know, and they put it in the automated machines, you know that they loaded it top and bottom threads. Is that how you're using it? And then a lot of them say no. But so we did this test. We positioned this in our in our dead weight frame. The picture on the left is how I would say 99% of the instruments come in our facility are loaded. Again, flat against the base, uh, an adapter in the top. This this cell would go in a cal machine. And then the picture on the right is the other 1%. Uh, and this is how the majority of our competitors will load instrumentation because it's easier for them. They can do tension and compression without breaking a setup. Their calibrations are a lot quicker. So this is, this is a one of what I consider one of those minor errors when you're looking at A2LA and, and talking about significant error sources. This error, if you look at it at capacity 24994, 24997, you can repeat this. You can do the test in your lab all day long, and you're going to repeat these same results. So the difference between loading the bottom threads in compression is about 0.01 to 0.012%. And if you do it, if you have dead weights or if you have a machine or if you ever come to our facility and want to see it, I'm happy to show it. 
every shear web load cell, almost every single one will act the same way. It's very, you can quantify this error. If you're going to our competitor and you're not, and you're loading flat, you can add an additional 0.012% in your uh, uncertainty budget and you will be good. Button load cell calibration. Lots of people see button load cells. This is new. We did this this summer. We did some testing on button load cells this summer. And here, the picture of the button load cells is on the left. We have a standard set up here. Standard set up over here. If you see it, I'm using a um, highlighter. Here we have a standard set up here to, uh, to about the center. Uh, flat relatively flat pad in the dead weight machine. I say manually aligned. This is usually the best we can do. And then we have data, 2011, 1997, 2018. We have the average, the standard deviation, uh, the maximum deviation, the max error. And it, it's, it's to, look at, to look at this down here, max deviation 21% error, 1.045%. So then we made, we specifically made adapters for our lab and these adapters are up top. It's a, it's a bottom that has a cutout for the, for the uh, cable. So, you know, if you don't support that, if you don't let that cable come out freely, there's, it's going to introduce a side load or uh, additional forces. And then there's this top adapter. And when we used our adapters and did the same tests, uh, zero degree, 120 and 240 rotation, standard deviation of two, max deviation of four, and a percent error of 0.2, roughly, you know, 0.199, 0.2%. So using the right adapters can improve the measurement result on these type of cells in this particular situation by 525%. Now, people use this button in load cells. A lot of them say, hey, manufacturer says I can get 0.5%. Guess what? You're not going to get 0.5% on these things. You know, 0.2% uh, is very, very, very good for this type of cell. I mean, we're we're rotating it. We're introducing, you know, uh, errors from rotation, reproducibility, and we're getting 0.2%. That's about the best you're going to get. If you buy this cell and expect 0.5, it's probably not going to happen. So that concludes some of our fixturing, uh, our um, discussion on fixturing. Uh, communication with the customer is key to address these issues. Unfortunately, this does not always happen. Examples of this scenario are as follows. Third party suppliers, you know, somebody else is sending instrumentation in and you can't talk to the end user. Purchasing departments that you can't get through to the end user. They just sent it off and said, hey, they need Cal and they're not going to tell you who the end user is. Uh, management that just wants a sticker. Large companies where it is difficult to reach the technician using the device. It, it all comes down to reaching whoever's using the device to see if you can replicate via calibration the way it's being used. And sometimes you just cannot get through that to that person, at which point you need to follow best practice and dot your I's, cross your T's, and note on the certificate what you did. So to minimize these errors, the ideal solution would be to calibrate the device with the customer's adapters or have the customer send the appropriate adapters to the reference lab for calibration. That's really what needs to happen. If you have instrumentation, you need to send the adapters in with it for calibration to ensure it will repeat when you get it back. So some measurement errors, uh, the ones highlighted here in red are the ones we talked about. We have uh, two and four day, two and five day training courses that uh, we have a two day force class where we dis discuss all these other errors, cable stiffness and mounting using mass weights instead of force weights. A lot of these are in the blog. So if you don't really want to come to the class and you go to our blog, you can read all about any of these uh, different excitation voltages, errors from used batteries. Uh, molecular excitement, molecule excitement decline, ascending versus descending, using the pro timing errors, appropriate exercise cycles. Timing errors is the only one I think is not a blog. I did a, a presentation at ASTM. It will be a blog at some point, um, but most of these are in, in the blog. Uh, you can go read them or you can attend, a, if you're interested to attend a class, I welcome anybody to come attend a two day or five day class, whatever, whatever you need. So buyer beware. Uh, I said we were gonna talk a little bit about scopes and then we're gonna talk about uh, uncertainties. So 
buyer beware not all scopes of accreditation are realistic yes yeah, some are like unicorns here pictured to the right so some people in metrology industry have coined the term scope wars instead of star wars and not all auditors know what to look for in fact several consultants even give the wrong advice uh we see this all the time the next section will deal with some scope examples that are realistic some unrealistic and common violations of standards including asdm e74 and iso 17025 so how do you know what you're getting this is our scope so i naturally I'm biased. We 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 put in everything, so we call out. We say, "Hey, our CMC is this. It's dead. We use dead weights here, uh, from five to 105 grams force at 003. Yeah, we're using little tweezers and stacking weights and all the other stuff. And then we have uh, dead weight machines. Uh, we have several dead weight machines. We have five dead weight machines. We have a machine that." Uh, transfer standard that goes to a million pounds and then we have a transfer standard that goes to 2.25 million pounds or 10 mega newtons because we should be speaking in si i know this we don't usually work in si but we should be speaking in it and then we call out on our scope we call out things like force calibration uh ASCM E74, class A, ISO 376, class half, one, two. This is what we're audited for. And then on here, on the other side, we're calling out class, you know, double zero and class, uh, class double A. Uh, and you need dead weights to do this. And then we're also calling out stuff uh, like forces can be applied incrementally and decrementally. So we have our standards over here, they're dead weights. They're, you know, we have them calibrated. Most of them are calibrated uh, to SI uh, by NIST. And then on the other side, we say, we have our other secondary transfers calibrated by NIST and using their dead weight stack. And we have them calibrated incrementally and decre decrementally. So we, we say, we say that on our scope that we can do increasing and decreasing forces. If you need a hysteresis point, if you need SEB, it's important that you go to a lab that can, that has, hysteresis that that has their device calibrated uh with hysteresis points so and then on we also do torque i didn't talk much about that but we have a we have the second most accurate torque machine in the world so uh comment references that forces can be applied increasing and decreasing again some of that uh here's a more common scope the cmc numbers look believable uh the issue is the percent for cmc for load cells is difficult to quantify are they taking the worst case and has this lab calculated cmc correctly we have no idea um looks looks pretty good it looks pretty believable but we have if you read they have no notes they're not really telling you what they're doing it says just load cells eh. And then we get to this. Um, here's a scope. I love looking at these. Uh, hey, they have a load cell that's up to 500 pounds, and their uncertainty is 1.7 grams. So it's part of a 15-page scope. They probably sent two auditors in. They didn't catch this. And to believe a 500-pound load cell has a measurement uncertainty of 1.7 grams or 7.5 parts per million, it's just plain silly. That's a load cell. NIST, who uses primary deadweight standards, published at four parts per million for their standard uncertainty. That's not even times two. So NIST standard uncertainty, their best, is eight parts per million, and this lab is claiming 7.5. Uh, we use we use deadweight standards uh, known to within 008 for standard uncertainty, expanded uncertainty. We multiply that by the appropriate coverage factor to gain 95% confidence. That's 0 0.0016 per dead dead weight and then the best load cells in the world to have cmc's around 0.002% of full scale those are the best ones like our million pound load cell or 4.4 mega newton load cell cost us over a hundred thousand dollars and that has a 0 0.002 there's no way any load cell is going to be better than uh the reference standard used to calibrate it just plain silly this this should not have happened and then then here's one that's just careless uh for those that are that are following along uh the wrong units are called out for force if you look at this they're saying hey dead weight we do e74 and yet if we look over here they're saying up to pound feet they're they're using torque they're saying they do e74 master load cells e74 but yet they're saying hey we do torque. Pound feet is torque. No other way. No other way around it. So, plus to calibrate accordance with the ASTM E74 would require deadweight calibrations in a class AA loading range. At half a million, the reference standard would have to be sent to NIST. I know who this lab is. They're not sending their stuff to NIST, and therefore this is a garbage 
absolute garbage garbage scope and the auditor shame on the auditor because they should have they should have picked that up to the wrong units uh or they're talking torque when it's force so if you're calculating for cmc's there are some guidance documents available uh ncsli rp12 uh there's astm the committee maybe someday will have a guidance document they do have a, a fair appendix um, if you combine that appendix with a2la r205 you actually have something pretty good and we are currently developing a guidance document and plan on having future webinars on how to ca calculate for cmc's if anybody wants a copy of my rough draft guidance document that's currently with a2la i am welcome to share it i welcome any comments if anybody's interested please please email me uh at, at any time h slumbrun at mh force you can have the document post comments we can have good discussions on it because we I am actively working on this I want to get it released so somebody has some type of guidance for force measurements I see auditors do all kinds of crazy stuff and it's wrong they need they need some guidance to go and check off things so for CMC's for ASTM E74 calibrations, uh, this is the, if you don't have ASTM E74, you can use SEB nonlinearity his, hysteresis. You can do some other things. We, I'll get to that. Um, you normally need the calibration report, the uncertainty of the instruments that were used to perform the calibration, calibration history. You're going to want that for stability. Manufacturer specification sheet. You're going to need that for temperature if you're operating at different temperatures. Error sources, if known. Hopefully after today, you'll know to send the adapters in with the instrument and those minimize those error sources and the end user will then have to conduct a repeatability studies if you have more than one technician you should do r and r between the technicians and then complete proficiency testing requirements you have napt sapphire lots of labs out there that uh even even we can help you with pt tests if interested so un uncertainty propagation uh our technical director and i wrote a paper it's published in cal lab it's online this is this is this is just a little bit just diving into it uh here's the tiers for uncertainty tier zero is primary standards we put a load cell in the machine and calculate all this using the well sathered weight equation tier one is now we shift we shift that um we shift that over and then tier two would be the secondary calibration laboratory uh, using, you know, one of our, you know, one of our machines or uh, going out and doing something else. So basically the, the point is uh, without going into too, too much detail, we did some tests. We used dead weights. We used the best load cells and we basically at the 20 percent point, which is table follows, we, we obtained in our calibration in our calibrating machine using our the best load cells our load cells calibrated by dead weight standards and you know the hvm dmp40 indicator all that we achieved 02 percent at 20 percent and talking to lots of different customers in general around that 20 percent point they're re they're achieving 0.02 percent to 0.03 percent using using our calibration service our our machines and everything else that's the point so multiple if you want to maintain 01 02 um you're going to need multiple standards and changing standards introduce additional error so but anybody with a pdf uh can download download that paper and read more about it other than that um we have a downloaded excel sheet to help labs ca uh calculate uh cmc this sheet is free to download you can go to mh force file support and download it i'm going to show some pictures on this it's we don't have enough time to go into it in, in full detail but these are pictures. There's red red boxes up here. If you click on these boxes, you will get descriptions and notes that tell you exactly what to do, what to put in, uh, what the sheet does. So it is a very good reference. It will also use you can. There's a drop down here. There's a drop down that if you're not using ASTM E74, you can stick in nonlinearity hysteresis or SEB. So that's that. I encourage anybody that's free to download to go to go download that, look at it, look at our blogs. The next section of this is going to deal with published standards and show examples of labs not following these standards. Best practice is to follow the standards. Think quality, do not cut quarters. So I talked about E74 a lot. This section is going to be rel relatively quick. Uh, we do a full webinar on E74. But the, the, if, if you're doing Cal for E74, the important things are primary standards are required to assign an ASTM class AA loading range. You cannot assign class AA without primary standards. Those secondary standards with the class A range can only assign a class A, and then the class A 
um, devices are then used to calibrate testing machines. The way ASTM works is primary standards need to be better than 50 parts per million, secondary standards 0.05, so we're creating a 10 to 1, working standards 0.25, testing machine 1%. Other, other types of calibration form may not require TAR nor should they? Uh, the challenge is figuring out uh, if they are calculating their CMCs properly. ASTM has been around since 1974. It's not broken. They're, they do need to change some things, but this, this has worked well for, for years, and uh, the uncertainty sheet that we've created works with ACE E74 to help you if you're doing that type of calibration. So ASTM E74 do not. What, what labs do, and I have some examples of this, do not assign a class AA loading range unless you are calibrating with primary standards accurate to better than five parts per million, 0.005%. Do not assign a class A loading range unless you are calibrating the device using secondary standard that was calibrated directly by primary standards. Note, a force measuring instrument with a class A loading range cannot assign a class A loading range. A force measuring instrument with a class AA loading range cannot assign a class AA loading range. If you're not following E74 or don't know much about it, that may make sense. That may just be gibberish right now. But here's an example. Uh, here's an example of a CERT ASTM not being followed. If we look at this report, the uh, re report of calibration, we have numerous things going on. Uh, the secondary, an instrument, a secondary force standard is an instrument or mechanism the calibration of which has been established by primary force standards. So this is all about the criteria for it. But if we look at this report here, right over here, I made the section a little bit bigger. They're using this lab is using uh, interface 25k gold reference standard. And over here, they're assigning a class AA loading range. Well, if you remember from the previous slide, that's a no-no. They're not allowed to do that. That breaks that whole TAR, it breaks the whole system. It breaks the chain of traceability. It's any calibration this lab performs and does this is not valid. So there you go. Class AA, class A, they cannot assign a class AA and they are doing that. So, and they're doing it with a reference standard. So ASTM, ASTM LLF is not the expanded uncertainty. That's another thing that they were doing here. Oh, there's some other, so the AS, ASTM represents that uh, the expanded uncertainty is less than the reference standard uncertainty in, in this scenario and this sort so lots of things going wrong here. Here's another one. We see this a lot. Uh, some calibrations provider providers claim zero can be used as uh, the first calibrated test point. That's not true. There's the section 8.6 says the loading range shall not include forces outside the range of force applied during calibration. And then section 7.2.1 says in no case shall the smallest force apply be below the lower limit of the instrument defined by the about 400 times the resolution. Uh, again, we have a full webinar on ASTM explained. I'm just touching the basics of what I see labs do that is wrong. So in this example, the class a lower limit would need, needs to be reported as 500 pounds. They are not doing that. They're reporting it as 192.3. That's wrong. So right there it is. So do not, do not assign a class A or double A loading range below the first non-zero force point. There's the sections again. You have this for if you want to go back and reference it, you can get the PDF. You can pull ASTM E74 and look at these sections. This is verbatim, word for word, of what's in the section. So then we get to the right calibration provider. Some calibration providers do not include enough information to provide traceable measurement. So we look at this cert. What is wrong with it? Uh, there's no mention of measurement uncertainty of the reference standard anywhere. Claims directly traceable to NIST and not to SI. I mean, I see these certs like this all the time. Does not report uncertainty per point. That's ILAC P14. If it's an accredited cal, they need to do that. And then and then makes this, this is my favorite. Uh, they make this statement that says, meets all published specification, but does not list any of them. So it's just any specification that's out there, hey, we, 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 we meet it. That's, uh, and then the other questions, was it exercise? We don't know. You know, there's a, that article on molecule excitement decline, I'll explain exercising and some other things. So good question. So 
a lot of people have made it through this far. The question is, I have a 10,000 pound device with an accuracy of half percent of full scale, plus or minus five pounds. My calibration certificate says the unit reads 10,004 when 10,000 pound was applied. Is my device in tolerance? So I've applied it here and I put more points because a lot of people ask, well, what, what, what's it at other points? So I have 5,002 and 10,004. Is my device in tolerance? Well, if it's an accredited calibration, we need to take the measurement uncertainty into account. And depending on what lab did the calibration would depend if it's intolerance or not, or if a statement of compliance could be made, what method was used. This, this, this band right here is using method five from ANSI Z540.3. There's also method six, four, three, two, one. There's other ways to do risk. Method five is, is ILAC. I think if you, we go back to ILAC G8 is the preferred method, but there's, that's, that's in a whole nother debate. And if, and if you're interested in measurement risk, attend the measurement risk webinar. We'll discuss discuss all this in a lot more de detail. But what's important today is if measurement uncertainty is not being reported properly by your service provider, there's no way to know if the device is intolerance and you do not have a traceable measurement. That's what's important. If you want an accredited calibration and they're not reporting measurement uncertainty, your measurements are not traceable and therefore not accredited if it's not reported. In this graph, anything to the right, are of those red lines is the measurement risk error, and and this one has 34.4% uh, risk of of not being intolerance when the lab is saying it it was. So, question is, do you know if your calibration provider is passing instruments that should not be passed? TUR Morehouse versus typical force lab. There's the formula tolerance over expanded uncertainty. Expanded uncertainty is usually defined by big U. I use two in this. Be wary of this. The, these two should actually be the Ks that give you 95%. This is just a quick example that with this formula. Typically, uh, 10,000 pound device, uh, we calibrate it. Uh, we have a test uncertainty ratio of 22 to 1. Competitor calibrates uh, a device that's their, their CMC is 05 of applied. Uh, they're at 1 to 1. So chances are they're not going to be able to call the device intolerance unless it's, unless it's perfect where, where we can still say that device is intolerance. And if they can't call it intolerance, they're going to have to report an out of tolerance adjusted. And then what does that do to you and your quality system? That's for you to make the decision. Here's a graph. And here's what I just said. When the uh, measure values change to 10,004, most people would think the device is still in tolerance. When we calibrate it, because our uncertainties are so low, the resolution, the repeatability the instrument was good, uh, it is in. When the lab with a CMC of 0.5% calibrates it, the risk goes from 0.0, .0 to 34.47. And that was the picture that I showed earlier. This is that same graph right there. How do you know if it's intolerance um, right here? If we do it, total risk is 0%. We could send this instrument back, say, hey, at 10,004 pounds, you have an intolerance condition, keep using the instrument. So common issues with force calibration laboratories, CMC's values that are unrealistic. We discussed that. Measurement uncertainties reported to end customer are less than the scope. Uh, showed you an example of that with that one cert, that one, that one calibration certificate, which is bad. And it's a big, that's from a big calibration lab that does a lot of calibrations. And lack of understanding of the E74 standard, that happens. People say, okay, we'll do E74 when they're not, they're not audited or uh, they're not accredited to actually do that. It's not on their scope. And not properly evaluating measurement risk or probability of false accept. These are all things to be aware of. What are our best measurement practices? Well, hopefully you've taken away the, uh, using the right calibration provider who has a measurement process and certainly capable of meeting your needs and follows published standards. Uh, making sure the calibration replicates how the instrument is being used, very important there. Lots of error sources uh, examples that we showed. Using the right adapters to ensure results are repeatable. And we did not discuss this, but having competent technicians and that sheet that we have uh, available online to do the CMC also has an R and R for technicians where you can test one technician against each other. It also has something for proficiency tested testing that you can do EN ratios and some other stuff. But the right calibration provider. So this is our webinar. It's about us. Uh, we strive for a hundred percent uh on time delivery doesn't always happen but we are very high we're high 90s the majority of the time uh things get in the way we, people don't get back to us we get head up, held up on asking the questions asking the adapter questions and and sometimes that that gives us a a, a little bit of a bump on the score because people care about time but 
our mission is to be regarded as the best independent force and torque calibration resource in the world by providing realistic solutions and continually develop new product to meet customer needs. We also like to defy the, the averages and meet 100% on quality delivery and overall customer satisfaction. Doesn't always happen, but we strive for it, and it does happen the majority of the time. So thank you, everyone, for being there. I'd like to tell you, before we have questions, we have uh, promotions going on till the end of the year. If anybody's interested, we have this new benchtop calibrating machine. If you're lifting hand weights, doing handheld force gauges, right here, handheld force gauges shown. If you're doing handheld force gauges, low force load cells, button load cells, any of this, this, this machine will save a lot of back break, uh, a lot on your back by lifting weights, by eliminating the need to lift weights on and off uh, the devices if you're using it that way. It will align everything in there. So with the proper adapters, you can do compression and tension and not have to break setup on, on these handheld force gauges. On button load cells, we have the right adapters if you want to do them small force. This machine can control the force to 0 .005. Uh, pounds uh, with the right load cell and spring setup. We have a promotion that's any two machines, two, two bench tops, two, any two machines, $2,000 off. We also have this Hattie indicator. I love this indicator. It's a true six wire USB indicator. Hook it up to the load cell. You take the coefficients from the report. You can always read direct engineering units. That's $200 off till, till the end of the year and then we have a free laptop with Morehouse software installed on any load cell system purchase so if you purchase a load cell system with the Hattie you get the free laptop $200 off the Hattie and if you buy the calibrating machines you could get $2,000 off that if you're not a member of our force measurement insider we give you updates on upcoming webinars blogs promotions everything else uh, please sign up to that and I would like to thank everybody and I would like to end with this great quote by Grace Hopper which is one accurate measurement is worth a thousand expert opinions so thank you everybody I'm going to end the recording and take questions if ever anybody's on and have questions and has questions thank you